Good morning. I want to welcome you to the online services of uh, Ellicott Baptist Church. That sounds very weird, doesn't it? To talk about online 
services and uh, coming to you through uh, the internet. We're grateful again for the opportunity to do so in this day and time, and the privilege that we have to uh, open to you the Word of God later this morning. We'll sing uh, some songs of praise unto God, and we trust and hope that you are getting ready, gathered together now here to, uh, to kind of worship with us in spirit and in truth. And you know, um, uh, the great thing is, is, is we can do that. We sure miss, I've heard from a number of our uh, people over this week uh, about the, uh, the struggle of being absent from uh, assembling together and missing the fellowship of other uh, church members, believers, that just uh, kind of takes away uh, when we do this. Uh, but you know, our, uh, our whole society is in, uh, is in this trouble. This is not just a United States thing. This is a worldwide uh, thing that is going on. I have read a lot of missionary letters. For some, for some reason, a number of them came in. I've spent a lot of time looking at them, reading missionary letters, writing down their prayer requests and such as that. And, and nearly everyone that I read finds themselves in this same predicament. They are either, some of them are back here in the States that were overseas and cannot get back over. Others uh, in their community are, are locked down, if you would. And some live in, in large cities in apartment buildings and basically are just kind of stuck inside. They are still allowed to get out a little bit, but uh, just everybody seems to be in this predicament. And uh, so we're gonna do, make the best that we can out of this and uh, come together and uh, provide uh, a sermon today as well as some, some music. And uh, we hope that you'll join in with us. I want you to look, I'm gonna start with a scripture. I didn't do this last week, but I'm going to start with a scripture from 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, and it's during the reign of King Jehoshaphat, and uh, during the, the context of this passage is that the Moabites and uh, the, uh, Am the Ammonites have, uh, are surrounding Judah, and they're coming against him, and he's somewhat trapped in uh, Jerusalem because it's a uh, it looks like it's going to be an ongoing conflict. And uh, the Bible records for us some things that Jehoshaphat shares with the people. And he says in chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles and verse number 12, he's talking to the Lord. And his prayer is very relevant for today. He says, O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. And here's what I'm, uh, the part I see is relevant. He says, neither know we what to do. And boy, I don't know if you find yourself in that place right now or not, kind of uh, just up in the air, not knowing exactly what's going to happen. And you know, if we dwell upon those things, that'll almost surely defeat us. But notice he didn't stop there. He says, Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Amen. And that's where our focus, we, we've got to make ourselves focus that way. Upon the Lord, upon his word, upon his service. And you'll find that you will have opportunity, even in this situation that you find yourself in, maybe home from work, or most all of us home from work, uh, not a lot to do, but you'll find that God will open you up opportunities of service, of times of worship, of times of prayer. I encourage you to spend a little more, some of the extra time you have, spend it. Get your eyes upon him, and one of the ways you do that is through his word and in prayer to him. And so this morning we want to get started, and uh, we're going to begin with some singing. So Brother Craig is going to come. <clears throat> Well, if you happen to have one of the hymn books that uh, we use here, we are using, I'm trying to get the name of it, Living Hymns. Uh, you can turn to song 155. We're going to sing the song, if not, it'll be projected on the screen there, uh, the song at Calvary, song 155, if you happen to have Living Hymns. Multiply to 
Sunday as well, and uh, and we will uh, again. We'll do services tonight at 6 p.m. and uh, then again Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and uh, then we will uh, we will be online next week again. And uh, we'll keep this service time at 10 o'clock for next week. But I hope to be able to uh, provide some Sunday school classes. Uh, for all our age groups this next week and I hope to be able to uh, have some of our Sunday school teachers Mrs. Ingram and uh, Brother Roy and Brother Wilson, Brother Craig and uh, we will have some services that we will uh, have a Sunday school lesson age appropriate and uh, we'll try to get those uh, videoed and put online so that individuals can watch them and that we can go this way and so that's our goal for this next week, that we can do that. Uh, Brother Craig's going to preach again for us on Wednesday night. And I believe he's going to continue on in the message he began last Wednesday. That following Wednesday is kind of what it looks like. I believe our president had said he would like to, he's kind of shooting towards Easter. We'll see, that would mean we'd still have to do another Wednesday online. And I believe that not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, what we'll do is we'll go back to what we've been doing uh, concerning the ABCs of Christian growth. And so we will not do that this Wednesday, but a week from this Wednesday, we will be on the letter H, the Holy Spirit. And we will do a lesson on the Holy Spirit that Wednesday night and uh, kind of go through the ABCs of Christian growth. And uh, depending on how this works, we'll see what we can do, even with uh, truth trackers and uh, youth group and things along that line, and we'll see how, how this works out. But at least for next week, we want to be able uh, to offer you some uh, age-appropriate Sunday school classes for your, your children and for your young people, and uh, try to keep them plugged in with their classes as best we can. And uh, we're going we're gonna to try to do that, okay? And so uh, let's, uh, let me give you some uh, prayer requests if I can. There's a family called the Torres family, the Wilsons know, and uh, the husband and wife have both tested positive for this virus. Uh, one of the issues is, is the mother is pregnant and about ready to give birth to a, to a little baby. So you pray for the Torres family, keep them lifted up in prayer and uh, be with them and ask God to help them. Also, uh, Mark, but we had a brother here a number a year ago or so his name is Jonathan Mislin and he's on his way to the Philippines and I read from uh, his letter this week that his dad Mike Mislin who's also a missionary in the Philippines has 
uh, been diagnosed with uh, cancer, a pretty, pretty aggressive case of cancer. So if you remember Mike Mislin, uh, also heard from Brother William Aya, and if you will pray for him, he's got some physical issues that he needs help with and has been down for a couple of months. They also find themselves in a position of uh, being pretty much in lockdown and uh, not able to go very many places. And so pray for them, if you will. Okay? And let's remember, pray for our president, our vice president. Pray for wisdom for him and for understanding. Remember, ask God for protection upon our medical people and things like that that seem to be high at risk. And, and uh, help us to keep our eyes focused upon the Lord, not so much focused upon uh, this coronavirus thing, although it's pretty tough if you just... Uh, watch TV and you can't hardly uh, do that or listen to radio. You're almost going to have to shut some media off, I think, to get your head clear. Yeah. And uh, remember, uh, that's who we want to look to. Is we want to look to the Lord. Uh, he will direct us. He will help us. And he will provide the things that we need. So let's go to the Lord this morning. Our Father, as we come, we want to thank you and give you praise, Lord, uh, for your grace and ask you please to be with us this morning in this service. And Lord, I know that many of our brothers, sisters in Christ are gathered around and, uh, from different churches all over the community. We uh, pray for the, the preachers that are preaching the word of God this morning. May you have your hand upon them, fill them with the spirit of God. And Lord, may you be with us today and help us in, uh, in this service. And may you use your word, Lord, uh, there's no hindrance to you in the matter of using your word. You could use it on a video and you could use it online and things along that line. We pray that it'll do have the effect, uh, Lord, that you send it forth for, that it will, your purpose, it will not return to you void and God you be honored and glorified. We pray for the needs, Lord, of uh, just all of the many people in our church. I pray for them and ask you please to continue to protect them and Keep us, Lord, uh, from this sickness, if, it, if you will. God, we ask your care upon us. I, I think of uh, Amanda today, and I think about her in the hospital. I ask and pray. Uh, she works there. You keep your hand upon her. Uh, God, protect her and her family from this. Just bless her and help her. And then, our Father, for the Torres family today, we, we come and ask you, please, for your intervention on their behalf. And pray, God, that you give their bodies the strength to fight this virus off as well as to protect their children and family from this and this little uh, baby that is about to be born. We ask and pray that you would have your hand there and be blessed there in that situation, that the uh, Lord, that the baby could be healthy and, and well as it comes out of the womb. And we just ask your hand to point her. And then our Father tonight, today, we ask you please for Brother Mislin. ask and pray your hand upon him, that you be with him minister to him god give him the treatment that he needs and what a tough time to have to be going to doctors and such we ask you to be with him think about kim as well and i believe she's going in and pray for her this week as she has a, another treatment ask and pray your care and <coughs> comfort in her life and for the coon family just be with them provide for their needs god also for uh brother william today we ask and pray for him god Pray for his family and pray for you to minister to him as he struggles in this time. And ask and pray your hand be upon him. You provide for them their financial needs as well. But God, you, you've used this to help him, Lord, to better uh, that he'll be able to minister more effectively for you. And Lord, we're going to give you the praise for what you'll do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in our songbook to song 320 in the garden. Again, the words we were decked up there for.
appreciate the ladies coming in and ministering to us this morning in music. We are practicing social distancing. And, uh, that was kind of a joke, but I don't know if you're laughing at home or not. <laughs> you could have your pick of any pew in this place if you were here today. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel this morning. So let me invite you to turn in your Bible there, if you will, 1 Samuel 23. And uh, at this time, I'll dismiss our juniors to junior church. Oh, <laughs> so this kind of I wanted to see if Hank would run to his bedroom at home. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's really, like I said, we're kind of in an odd position here today and uh, for the next couple of services that we're going to have. And uh, I hope it. Uh, I hope you have a longing in your heart uh, to be able for the time when we can come back together yes. to assemble and uh, and uh, worship the Lord here in one physical place. And uh, I trust that when we are able to do so, uh, my desire is that we will that the Lord will work in our hearts through this time and in this place that bring us to a place of this matter of drawing near to Him. And uh, that we will recognize uh, how many blessings that we have and, uh, and what a blessing it is to be a member of a New Testament church. What a blessing it is to, to be able to do so. And, you know, we've kind of, uh, we're kind of missing that and uh, don't have that opportunity in the same way that we do. We're missing the matter of assembly, going out and, and uh, talking to people about Jesus Christ and and you know, very often what happens is we get in a rut and we, we kind of take those things for granted and, and sometimes we, we, we're not the witnesses we ought to be. But I, I want you to know, there is a world out there that is very, very fearful and very scared. And uh, you know, I find myself very paranoid. I, uh, sometimes I get a little scratch in my throat and uh, you know, I want to take my temperature. The thing is, we don't have a thermometer, so I can't do that. I put my hand up here. I'm not supposed to touch my face. Uh, all of those things, but uh, hey, you know you can really, you can really get dwelling on the wrong things yes, if you're not careful. And so let's look at First Samuel chapter 23, and uh, we'll begin in verse number one. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna read the whole chapter at this time, but we're gonna try to go through most of this chapter and account in the life of David. And it says in verse number one, we'll read the first five verses. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they robbed the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And so as we look at this time in the uh, life of uh, David, great king of Israel, uh, he is not king yet, but he has been anointed king. As a young man, Samuel came and anointed him with oil. He is God's choice for the throne, but King Saul is the one that is on the throne at this period of time in David's life. And where we find David at this time, we find him on the run from King Saul. David has already defeated Goliath, and won a great victory for the Israelites. He become very popular in the land of Israel. And that popularity caused great jealousy and envy from King Saul. And Saul began to persecute him, so much so that he was, he was doing all that he could in making an attempt to, uh, to destroy and kill David. And so David finds himself on the run. And uh, he's in the land of Judah, in the wilderness, uh, really fearing for his life. He had to leave where the, uh, Saul's kingdom, he had to go from there. Uh, and uh, in the previous chapter, chapter number 22, Saul has even attacked the, all of the priests. In fact, he has killed all of the priests but one because 
uh, David had stopped off uh, to, at the temple or at the tabernacle, and there he had received some help from one of the priests who did not know he was running from Saul. David did not tell him. But Saul has kind of lost his mind and is hunting David like a dog. Um, uh, because of this, when David went to the wilderness, we find that there were many men in the kingdom at that time. If you look over, you can see in your Bible, chapter 22, if it's on the same page, you can look at verse 2. David went out into the wilderness to hide. His family found out where he was, and they went. And also, 400 men with their families came to him. It says, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain, David, over them. And there were with him about 400 men. By the time we get to this chapter, in chapter number 23, the Bible tells us, that there are 600 men with David, and uh, they are with him here at this time. Verse number 13 tells us that, that the number has grown, and so these are men from which came uh, David's familiar band of mighty men that came to him at this, that began at this time with him. And so David is living in the wilderness of Ju Judea. He's been joined by these 600 plus men, plus their families, and uh, their children, and all of these things. And really what we see about these people is they find themselves in a state of distress and of discontent. I was reading the illustration of a missionary, an Australian missionary, who in the 1950s through about 1970, before the communists came, went to Ethiopia. And he did some great works down there. He then, I think, went back to Africa to some different places. His name was Dick McClellan. And he's told about the time when he was there in Ethiopia and how God worked there among, through him and through other missionaries well, among the Ethiopian people. And he said in that country they had uh, come together and they held a, a, num a conference, a Bible conference down there. And they called the believers from all over and they gathered for this conference and began to preach to them. And one of the emphases, emphases of that conference was that they were challenging the young men of Ethiopia to give themselves to missionary service, and specifically missionary services, service to the other cultures that were found there in the land of Ethiopia. They wanted these men to go out into these villages to the other tribes of Ethiopia and preach the gospel to them. And after one of these services, uh, Missionary McClellan stated that about 20 young people stood uh, because they'd been asked to in the invitation. And they stood and they committed themselves uh, to say that they were willing to go. They were willing to go be missionaries, to go reach the people of Ethiopia with the gospel. And one of these men that stood was a young man by the name of Fanta. Fanta uh, stood with these other young men and uh, the leaders of that conference in, in that or place where they were holding the meeting told Fanta he, he needed to sit down. They, they told him that uh, he, he, could, he could not go. The reason for that was that Fanta was, uh, was crippled. He was physically disabled. His story is that when he was about six years of age, something happened to him physically, either uh, meningitis or polio or something along that line, and it paralyzed the whole left side of his body. And uh, because his family was poor, because there was not access to medical care, uh, they did nothing really about it. And, and uh, his arm, Fanta's arm and leg and the left side of his body remained paralyzed even now when he was a young man. Uh, his face did heal and he could speak clearly. He could sing beautifully, they said, but he could not walk. The way that he walked was he took a, a long pole and he would place that pole out in front of him and he'd plant it in the ground and then he would uh, pull himself. He was, he'd jump with his right leg and then he'd pull his left leg and his left arm and pull that up alongside of him. And so it, he couldn't get anywhere very quickly. And so that was kind of the idea. And uh, so the appeal in that conference to young men who preached the gospel was was so was for men that could go and could be physically able and walk miles and miles and go to these villages and evangelize 
And so when Phantom stood, Brother McClellan went to him and he said, uh, Phantom, maybe you could have a ministry of prayer. Maybe you could have a ministry of prayer. To which Phantom replied with a exclamation, Ah! That's what they told me the last time I surrendered to God. They told me to go to Bible college, and, and I went to Bible college, and I've prepared myself, and God has called me to go to the Oromo people, which was a tribe in Ethiopia. These Oromo people had a reputation. They were pretty much stayed by themselves. In fact, they were known to kill anyone that was a stranger that approached their land or their tribe. Well, anyway, they just kind of dis, they felt that Fanta's disability had disqualified him from this call to missionary service. But I want to go back to David here. Here's David's chosen king. If he is God, God's chosen king, we might begin to doubt that if you've read chapters 18 through about 30 of the book of 1 Samuel. David's life is a life of turmoil and trouble and struggle. And, uh, you know, we can relate to that because sometimes we find ourselves, even maybe right now, we find ourselves in a place of uncertainty. Asking ourselves, what do we do now? And so from this chapter in 1 Samuel, in the life of David, I see an example of what we do in times of uncertainty, of discontent, and distress. We read verses 1 through 5, and uh, that's where I'd like to begin. We, what we find, let me give you some tips here or some points from the scripture. One of the things you can find that you can do in times of uncertainty and uh, trouble is this, is you can serve the Lord. And we find here that David serves the Lord. We find that as he's in hiding, he's got these men around him, we find that news comes to David in verses 1 and 2 that the Philistines are coming into a, a city by the name of Keilah, which is about uh, south, 18 miles southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, David's out in that wilderness, uh, I think east of that. And uh, so David is hiding out, but news has come to David that the Philistines are coming, and, and every time the people of Keilah, Jews, uh, the tribe of Judah, these, these men, every time these men harvest their fields, they go to the threshing floors, the Philistines come in, and after they've done all the work, they take their grain, similar to what happened in Gideon's time. And uh, so David and his men are hiding from Saul in the wilderness, and he has his own problems, but now he hears of some problems of other people. And uh, David inquires of the Lord and asks the Lord, should I go, Lord? Lord, do you want me to go down there and help those people of Keilah and fight the Philistines? And the Lord says, go. And so David calls his men together here in verses 3 and 4, and he receives some opposition. He calls these men together and says, hey, we, we're afraid we... Uh, we need to go down and help. This is what's going on in Keilah. We need to go down and help these individuals. And David's men tell him, hey, we'd be afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go out and try to help them? If we uncover ourselves, Saul's hunting us. We, we can't be doing that. And so what we find is that David then turns around and he goes back to the Lord in response to this, this question. He goes back to the Lord and he inquires yet again. In verse number four, in response to the men's fear, and the Lord says to him again, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines in divine hand. And so David says, Look, fellas, I know you're afraid, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to go do what God says. We're going to serve the Lord. And David takes his men, and off they go to the village of Keilah, uh, and they have a great victory. Verse 5, they went there, they fought with the Philistines, and it says there an interesting thing, they brought away their cattle, the cattle that the Philistines had down there were probably, uh, what I've understood is that they probably were down there, what these Philistines were doing was these guys would thresh all their grain, they took these cattle to, to uh, carts, and they'd pull that grain back to the land of Philistia and leave the, the folks of Keilah with nothing. 
So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah, and he defeated the Philistines. He slew them. He ran them off. And uh, he also gets some spoils out of it. He brought away their cattle. Now, remember, David has an army. He has a crowd of 600 men, women, and children. They're dependent on him out in the wilderness. There's, uh, I've kind of looked at this like God's provision for him, these cattle and some of the things that went, that God took care of the needs. And uh, some of David's uncertainty in life at that time may have been, hey, how am I going to keep this army together? How am I going to provide for these individuals? And so that may have been what had happened. And when he got his eyes on the Lord and he did what the Lord wanted him to do, God gave him some answers to that uncertainty. Well, let's make an application today in our own lives. It's kind of hard to know what to do right now, right? Yeah. Kind of hard to figure out what to do with yourself or what you can do or what you should do and all of these things. And, and uh, if we're not careful, we can get overwhelmed by this sort of thing. But I want you to understand that one of the things you'll find is that you still can serve the Lord. You still can be used of him at this time, and you ought to seek him. No doubt, right now, you know some needs that I did not mention in, in prayer, but you have some needs, and you know some people who have some needs. Yes. And I want to encourage you to pray and ask God what he wants you to do concerning that. Let's move on. Let's look at verse number 6. It says, And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David, uh, to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into my hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about six hundred, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. Well, as David begins to serve the Lord, I want you to understand that not only does he, he find some things to do, but I, I do want you to understand that his anxiousness increased. The uncertainty was added. The things that were going to happen were added. And, you know, sometimes we think, okay, I, you know, I'm doing what's right, but things don't seem to be straightening out here. I, I just want you to know that's a pattern sometimes in the life of a believer. God never promises you uh, those that uh, if you'll serve him and do everything, everything's going to be rosy and uh, there will be no problems. What we see here is anxiousness increased. Uh, first of all, we see that Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah. Abiathar was the priest. He was the son of the priest. He was the only priest left at this time, which made him the high priest. And uh, you can read about that in chapter 22 this afternoon if you want to look that up. But what he did was he brought some things. He brought an ephod with him when he came. And it seems that he came to Keilah to be with, to, with David to, to this area. And so what he did was uh, David called for Abiathar. The bad news of Saul's madness and Saul coming to try to hunt David and his men down as they were coming. Uh, look, what a problem when life is uncertain is that life goes on. Sometimes the intensity, it, it seems to increase in life when it goes on. You know, if you're if not in fellowship with God today, if your priorities are not in the right place, him and his kingdom first, you can get overwhelmed. Yeah. And what happens when you do when that happens you, you, is you make bad decisions. Yep. You make bad choices when you're overwhelmed and you, you're not in right relationship with God. And so not only do we see that David serves the Lord, but here we see that David seeks the Lord. Yeah. David, if you would, he's drawing nearer to God. He wants to draw close to God to find out what it is he ought to do at this time. 
It says in verse 9 that David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. Saul had gotten news that David was hiding in Keilah, and he believed, you look at Saul, look here. It says in verse number 7, and it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. Now watch this. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand. Whoa. Here's King Saul. King Saul hasn't been right with God for a number of years here in the book of 1 Samuel. And yet as he finds David, which he believes he's got him trapped in a city with walls and gates, he thinks he can go sneak up on him. He believes God has delivered uh, David into, into his hands. He believed the Lord was working to set David up. You know, you can be very deceived if you're not careful and you're not walking with God. Yep. And Saul had gathered his armies together to come to Keilah, and uh, here David calls for Abiathar, and he asks him to bring the ephod with him, and he seeks him through word and prayer. I've got a quote here in my notes from a man by the name of Ella Alan Redpath. He used to pastor years ago at Moody Church. He was an Englishman. He, he said this. He said, we learn a principle here from David. He said, if you begin with God, your enemies grow small. If you begin with the enemy, you may never reach God. Boy, that's a good thought for today. Let me read it to you again. If you begin with God, your enemies grow small. If you begin with the enemy, you may never reach God. And so David calls for Abiathar, and he says, bring hither the, bring hither the ephod. The ephod was a, uh, was a garment that the high priest wore. It was a sleeveless garment that went on over his inner garment and uh, it, that, he wore that and he, he wore it when he went into the temple to go in and minister before the Lord in the holy place and in the holy of holies and attached to that ephod was a, was a breastplate that uh, contained 12 stones and each one of those represented the tribes of Israel and uh, many believe that inside that breastplate or inside that ephod was an inner pocket and in that inner pocket, it contained, there were two stones called the Urim and Thummim. And you see those, these came from Exodus chapter 28. You can read about these things there. But the Urim and the Thummim, the words mean, we're really kind of uncertain about what they were, but they mean lights and perfections. And they were connected with, uh, with the priest discerning the will of God in certain, quite for questions. And we see it used in the matter of Joshua, that it would be used in the life of Joshua when he would determine whether the Israelites would go in or come out and things like that. Um, we see it even later on in history that when the people of Israel came back from captivity, the, uh, some of the priests, their genealogies were questionable, whether they could actually be priests, whether they were actually Levites, and it was said that they should wait partake of the holy things until they they were, uh, the, the Urim and the Thummim were questioned. And the idea was that this Urim and Thummim was the priest would take those, and some way or another, you could ask of the Lord a yes or no question, and those, those uh, Urim and Thummim, those lights of perfection, would give an answer concerning the will of God. And so David, that's what we just read, David had heard that Saul was going to attack Keilah, he inquires of Abiathar and the ephod to determine what God's will is. Now listen, God didn't have access, or David, I'm sorry, David didn't have access to written scripture. You have the word of God. Amen. You have access to the throne of God to determine the will of God for the situations of life. There are many things in the Bible that God has spoken on, you know, salvation. Is, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, God Amen. wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to be holy. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. God wants his people to be led, filled with his spirit. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. We know that it's God's will for us to give thanks in everything. First Thessalonians 5.18. We know that he wants us to leave, live holy. That is God's will. First Peter 2.15. And we know that that can include suffering. First uh, 
1 Peter 4 and verse 19. Those verses all speak about the things concerning the will of God. You know, you have ways to discern the will of God, and that is this. Scripture, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the renewing of your mind, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And supplication, prayer, uh, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 27, as you go before God, the Spirit uh, maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. And so those are things, just a side note in that sense, that may be a little mysterious talking about that ephod, but David is seeking the will of God. And you ought to seek the will of God as well, but you're not looking for signs and things along that line or uh, circumstances. You're to search the word of God. You're to seek God in prayer, and God will make clear what he wants to do for you. But notice, as he does those things, he asks, is Saul going to come? If I stay here, is Saul going to come? And God says, yes, he will. And then he says, well, these men of Keilah, who we've just delivered from the Philistines, will they turn us over? And God says, they will turn you over. The will of God is revealed to him. I want you to know something. That <clears throat> David now knows the will of God. God has shown him what's going to happen. But action is required. What I mean by that is that sometimes we treat the will of God like this. We say, hey, you know what's going to be? It's going to be. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's often fatalism. That, that's not, see, if David and his men had stayed there, God had already said, hey, this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah. And so it says in verse 13, when David and his men found this out, it says David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah, and they went whithersoever they could. Boy, it caused great discomfort. I take it to mean they kind of scattered because they were at odds, and so they didn't all meet back together for a time yet. They just went wherever they could and, and make things work for them. But what it, what it required was, was, some, uh, was some action on their part. And you know, when you know the will of God in your life, you know the will of God from the Word of God, you need to act upon the will of God. Yeah. You know, David served the Lord, and, and David sought the Lord. And if you'll do that, what I want you to understand is that even in times of uncertainty, and even in times of bad circumstances, God will strengthen you. God will strengthen you. And here we see that in verses 14 through 29, that as David served the Lord, he went in obedience, he sought the Lord to ask if he should go help these men of Keilah. Look, David didn't have to do that. He could have just sat there and taken care of himself and his men. But David sought the Lord. Should I go? And God says, go. And he goes and he helps them. And then he finds that as he gets there, Saul has seen this as an opportunity to, to take advantage of him. And, and David, before he does anything, he seeks the Lord. You know, uh, while Saul was plotting, David was praying. And David was depending on the Lord. And I want to encourage us that at this time, we kind of do those things. You just don't take... Uh, everything that is going on in the media, don't, don't allow that to rattle you in that sense. You seek the Lord concerning that. But as David does so, we find that he find, he's back abiding in the wilderness, but we find that the Lord is going to act on David's behalf and to help him in this time of uncertainty. He's not going to fix everything, but God is going to help him. So look with me here at verse number 14. It says, And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in the mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. Amen. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood, and Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood. So first of all, what we see is David is strengthened by the Lord. He is strengthened by God's power. All right? Through God's power, God enables David at this time. It says in chapter 14, I'm sorry, in verse number 14, uh, the second part of it, it says that Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And listen, this tells us about the intensity of the battle every day. Saul sought him, and that it had to be tough, 
and it had to weigh on David. But I want you to understand something. It didn't matter because God had protected David. Saul, though he sought David, had no means to seek the Lord and his will and could not find David. He could not get to him. Why could Saul not ask the Lord? You know, he thought the Lord had delivered him. But Saul has no means to seek the Lord because Saul has killed the priest. That's no high, Saul has no high priest. But Abiathar had fled to David, the high priest. He's the only priest left. He had fled to David and he had brought with him the ephod. And that had kept David a step ahead of Saul. Saul has no high priest, but David does. And David understood the mind of the Lord. Saul thought he would track him, but he couldn't do it. So you say, what does that have to do with me? Well, you have access to the high priest. You have access to God in this time. The book of Hebrews 4 and verses 14 through 16 tells us this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Why do they have to hold fast their profession? Because they're wavering. They're in a time of trouble and uncertainty. But they, the writer says, hold fast. Look, don't, don't cast aside what you know to be right, what you know to be true. He says this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto him for what purpose? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, in the same way that David had access to Abiathar, the high priest, and could discern and understand the will of God and get direction, you as well. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have access to the throne of mercy through Jesus Christ, and you are promised that you can obtain grace to help yeah. in time of need through your high priest. Listen. No matter where you find yourself today, in all your confusion, in all of your anxiety, I want you to understand something. You have access to God, and you have access through Jesus, your high priest. And if you have all kinds of other things going on, and you are worried about all sorts of things, if you have that one thing, you have the thing that matters more than all else. Amen. All else, you have access to the very throne of God right now today through Jesus Christ. Yep. And we should be taking advantage of that. Notice how it worked. I read you the first part there, verse number 16. David's hiding out in the wilderness. He's in the woods specifically. And it says there in the first part of verse 16, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose, and he went to David into the wood. You see? As David was out in the woods, Jonathan, Saul's son, came to David, and he found him. How come Saul, who was in that same wilderness with all of his spies and all of his troops, couldn't find him? The answer is because you have access to the priest. You have access to the Lord. See how God works. Saul couldn't find David. But Jonathan could. Jonathan could because of his relationship to the Lord. But we see David is strengthened by the Lord through God's power. We see David is strengthened by the Lord through his people. Through his people. The Bible says there, look with me again at verse 16, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood. I didn't read you the last part of the verse on purpose because we'll notice what it says that Jonathan did when he got there and strengthen his hand to God. He strengthened David's hand in God. In a sense, I think we could make application that what, what David, what Jonathan did when he came to David was he came to him and, and he took David's hand and he placed it in the hand of God 
And in that sense, what I mean by that is this. I believe that what Jonathan did was he reminded him of what God had promised him. He remind him, reminded him of the promises of God, of his power, of God's strength, of God's ability. And he encouraged David in the Lord. Look at verse 17. And he said unto him, fear not, David, don't fear. For the hand of Saul, my father, watch this, shall not find me. How can Jonathan be so confident? Because he knew the promises of God to David. Amen. God had already anointed him and said, this is my king. Well, David's not even 30 yet. He's in his mid-20s. He's a young man with a lot of responsibility. But Jonathan says, my father will not find you. Will not find you. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And he says also, my father, he shares a little personal information. My father knows this too which explains some of my father's actions. But Jonathan came and he strengthened his hand in God. He reminded him of the promises of God. Let me ask you a question here. We talked about serving the Lord. Does God use us to encourage his people who are in troublous times? Yeah. And before you say yes, it's probably too late. I want you to understand <clears throat> What would have happened to Jonathan had he got caught leaving the woods there by Saul's men? You think they'd have tortured him? Try to find out where David was at? You think it might have cost Jonathan his life? Yeah. Hey, listen, sometimes, sometimes serving God, ministering to God's people, strengthening the people of God, there's a price involved with that. There's a cost. Are, are you willing to pay a price? To encourage the people of God. Let me ask you something. Have you ever have you ever written a letter to one of our missionaries? A personal letter? To an absentee from your somebody's been gone from your Sunday school class for a time? You know, let me tell you something right now, and just a, a way you could minister right now. Think of two or three people that uh, you miss in the church, or or two or three folks you think, hey, you know what? I haven't heard much about them. I, I don't. You haven't heard. And send them a card in the mail. Look at your church address list or something along that line, and send that out. You know, as I was dwelling upon this and thinking upon this, I have a lot of missionary addresses, but most of my missionary addresses are uh, are churches. They're. Uh, they're churches where we send the support to, and that's the church they're sent from, and that's how we do that. We, we don't necessarily send it to, to wherever they live or wherever they are. But I want you to know, I, I've read a lot of letters. I read from Brother Disney, uh, who is right now somewhere in a high rise, and I think he's in Santiago or somewhere like that, but he's in Chile. And because of his physical condition, I mean, he is basically stuck inside the four walls of that apartment. I've read the same thing uh, about many of the other missions, Brother Seth Richards over in Germany. The place is kind of shut down, just like it is here. And I'm telling you, it's like that all over the world. Imagine what it would be like to get a letter, a personal letter, from you and your family. Saying, hey, Brother so-and-so, maybe mention, find out his wife and children's names, and mention it. Say, I've just been praying for you this week, and I wanted to let you know. I know you can send an email, and I think an email is good. I'm just telling you, my experience has been, uh, I get lots of emails, but my experience has been, for the most part, when I go to a mailbox and I pick up a letter, and I get it from somebody, there's something about that. Remember, we used to have a lady in our church, Miss, Mrs. Simpkins. That was her ministry. She not only sent to missionaries, she sent to all kinds of people. She, she kept the greeting card people in business. You know, very often she would strengthen people's hands in the Lord because God uses his people to strengthen them in the Lord. Before we move on, we're just about that big. Before we move on, I also want to encourage you with something here. Notice where this is placed, where Jonathan comes in at. He comes in right after 
David gets the answer from when David says, God, will the men of Keilah deliver us up? Yes. And God says they will. Yeah. And if you'll look down to verse 19, David is out in the woods, and it says in verse number 19, Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hakalah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. These Ziphites, David is in his homeland. This is land which he knew. He grew up in this area. These Ziphites are from the same tribe as David, and yet they have reached out to Saul and offered to betray him. But I want you to understand something, that right in between the betrayal of the men of Keilah and the betrayal of the men of Ziph is this encouragement of David's friend, Jonathan. It's hard to tell what that means. It's a beautiful thing that God, in between these two experiences of hardship, men willing to turn on David, Jonathan comes and reminds him that God's still with him. Not everybody's against him, though it seems like it. And so we see that God strengthens David through his power. We see that God strengthens David through his people. And then one last thing, real quickly, the men of Ziph have betrayed, have told Saul, we know where he's at, come on down, we'll deliver him over to you. And Saul brings his armies down to the wilderness of uh, Judea, and he begins to hunt David. And it says in verse 25, it says, Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David his men, and his men on that side of the mountain, and David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. Man, if I had music, if I could get Brother Lloyd to play some music here, it would be super suspenseful music as you were reliving this portion of Scripture. I mean, Saul and his men, and the idea of this is, they haven't seen David yet, but they are right there. And David and his men know. And they're running on opposite sides of a hill down there, running around, just trying to stay ahead of Saul. And then watch it, verse 27. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. What I want you to see is that right at that moment, it almost seems like it's just, if it was a movie, it'd be just to go around that next clump of trees, and there would be David and his right. men, and the army is there, and all of a sudden, Saul's Saul cell phone rings. <laughs> and they say, Saul, stop! The Philistines have invaded! They've come on, you've got to come back! Bring the men back! We're in trouble! And Saul stops. God strengthens his people through his providence. Well, the idea of providence is how God controls the circumstances yes, amen. in the life of his people. Yes. It happens right when Saul and his men are about to overtake David. You know, that's one of the, God doesn't always do it like that. But has he ever done something for you right in the nick of time? When you have to stand back and say, "Man, that had to be you. It could be no one else. Listen, what the writer of 1 Samuel is trying to tell us here is this. You should respond to this God. Yes, he's done it for David, but he's done it. You should respond to the God who works like this in the lives of his people. That's what the writer is looking for. He's looking for a response. Let me give you an illustration. There was a mother that was <clears throat> had been on maternity leave from her office. And uh, one day after she'd had the baby, uh, a few 
few weeks or a month or so after she came into the office to show off her new baby who was only a few weeks old. Her female co-workers were ooing and eyeing over the little baby who was her, the mother's second child. And while they were doing that, her first child whom she brought, a seven-year-old boy, was standing there with her and he asked his mother if he could have some money to go buy something out of the vending machine that was in the break room. And she took some change out of her purse and she handed it to her son and he started to go and she said, what do you say? And he turned around and replied, you're thin and beautiful, mom. <laughs> she was looking for a certain response. You know, in this chapter, God is looking for you to give him a certain response. He's looking for you to ooh and ah over him, to worship him once in a while. Lord, there's none like you. God, I know your faithful. No one else can do it. Who's the God that looks like our God? What's the coronavirus? What, what's that to him? I'm not trying to downplay it. I'm just telling you, whatever circumstance you find yourself in today, it's not bigger than him. Amen. It's not greater than our God. Sometimes God is looking for the response of confession and repentance. And sometimes he's looking for praise and thanksgiving and adoration. Listen, don't let this go by. God has spoken to your heart. You, res you respond to him. You give him the response he's looking for in your heart, with your mouth. You honor him. Before I go, I want to go back to the guy I was talking to about at the beginning. His name was Fanta. Fanta ended up going to that tribe, that Oromo tribe in Ethiopia, the ones that killed strangers and were very ferocious. He ended up going on his own because the missionaries just said, hey, you can't go. The trip to where the tribe lived was normally a two-day walk from where they were, but it took Fanta five days to get there. And uh, as he struggled along and went, and he came upon it. When, when he came up upon these people, a group of these people that were taking care of their cattle, this fierce warrior tribe, was he found out that they did murder strangers. But they honored people who were crippled. Nobody knows why, but obviously something in their past had caused them to have a certain reverence and an esteem and an honor and a care for those who suffered from physical disabilities. The amazing thing was that the place where Fanta was was a place where only he could go. Those other strong Ethiopian men would never have been made. But because of Fanta's physical disability, his physical problems, it was the very thing that qualified him to go where he was. It was said of him that where he went, he planted five churches among that tribe of people. And they said that within the first year of his ministry there, he had 250 professions of faith Amen. among those Roman people. The thought is this, there, that which was such a hardship which brought such uncertainty, that which seemed to disqualify him in the eyes of many was the very thing that personally fitted him and made him most qualified with the Lord our God. And who's a God like our God? Let's bow our heads this morning. Our Father, as we come to the close of this message in thought here today of the uncertainty and the trouble that sometimes that we find ourselves in we ought to be reminded that it is kind of how we respond to you and 
Lord, how we trust you, which allows you and gives us opportunity, gives you opportunity to use us in some way or some manner that we can bring honor and glory to you. Father, I know there are folks listening. God, that your spirit has spoken to their hearts. They've had to acknowledge in their own hearts the spirit has borne witness with their spirit concerning the, the way that you work, the things that you've done in their life. And Lord, I pray that before we finish here, before we get up from the couch and, and uh, put the phone down and, and stop, but before we do all of those things, that Lord, we will respond to you in the way that will please you and give you honor and glory. And so, Lord, we ask you, please, to use the scriptures, use the teaching this morning in the lives of your people. And we will praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know how to ask you. It's kind of hard to give the invitation, so I'm just asking you to take a moment or two. You respond. When it's all done. We're going to have Brother Craig come back here and close us. But I, I just want to challenge you today. You know, I don't know what you're looking to do. I I want to throw it out to you. I don't know whether I did already or not. But you know, I don't have any home. I don't have home addresses for those missionaries. They're they're just not. We use the church, but those missionaries have some home addresses. And maybe be interested in coming in someday this week, coming into the office. I'll set you up with a bunch of old missionary letters. You go through and you make up some. Uh, you might be used to make up a list of some home addresses, and I'll post those out there where you can send a card to some of our missionaries, to some of our, and uh, just be an encouragement. Maybe that's a way God would use you. I don't know what, what God's doing in your life, but I don't waste this time. Don't waste this time. In a sense, your life has slowed down. You don't spend it watching too much TV. You don't spend too much time on the internet. Spend some time seeking God. Look for a way. Just like David, say, Lord, should I go to so-and-so? Should I go here? Seek him. Let God use you to minister to someone during this time. services with what's streaming here with this song 579 in our hot tempo. God will take care of you and we'll forget those words of life.
Boss, we bow before you. We're grateful for your uh, providential hand in the life of David as we got to experience today through the book of uh, 1 Samuel there. I'd ask that today you'd help us to understand that you use the likes of men like men, uh, men and women. We think of Jonathan here. And he just came at the exact right time. Lord, you just sent him and he was the right encouragement to David. And uh, then again, even your providential hand that David is literally just about to be overtaken and yet you sent a message to Saul that the Philistines had just invaded and, and Saul turns his army as well as his men and they go back to uh, defend their own land there. Lord, just uh, your providence in our lives is just, uh, it's mind-blowing, Lord. We just ask that you would continue to guide us. Pray that this week you'd encourage each and every one of us that we might be used in the lives of our believers and the lost people alike. Lord, I recognize with the social distancing, this seems to be a struggle. But Lord, maybe through text, through email, through a personal letter, may that all of us would endeavor to serve you, love you, and be used of you. We thank you for it in Christ's name.